Well, thank you for joining me. I'm here in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And Cambodia, April 1975, when the murderers Khmer Rouge was closing in on this city, is the setting for the story that I am about to tell you. You will see and hear from the legendary Air America pilot, Neil Hansen, recount his story of flying the very last civilian aircraft out of this country on the very day that the Khmer Rouge took this country. Last day in Cambodia was rather traumatic. Neil began his aviation career flying for the celebrated Teamsters boss, Jimmy Hoffa. Subsequently, Neil came to Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War and began flying wartime missions for Air America, which was the CIA proprietary. Lee Gossett tells that when he came to Saigon in 1966, Neil was the chief Air America pilot there. Neil, shot down over Laos, flew wartime missions in Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Neil, lacking U.S. Embassy connections, was upcountry, and he heard that the Americans had left days earlier. Coincidentally, my good friend Les Strauss, former Cassie and Air America pilot, who incidentally was one of four pilots who flew the Hmong evacuation from Longcheng, Laos in May 1975, was flying in and out of Phnom Penh at that time, and he flew one of the last evacuation flights of U.S. Embassy personnel before Cambodia fell. I will relate some stories from Les during those dark days when Cambodia descended into a horror of biblical proportions. And then I'll take you down the road here a few blocks to the former U.S. Embassy, which ordered the Operation Eagle Pool, the evacuation of U.S. personnel. American participants in the Second Indochina War, from Washington on down to the provincial capitals, found much to disagree about in our conduct of that war. But on one opinion, there was general agreement. The Cambodian War was unparalleled in its ferocity and barbarity. At least in the other countries, combatants took prisoners. In Cambodia, one CIA officer received a puzzled stare from a local Cambodian commander when the CIA officer tried to establish an interrogation center. The Cambodian commander told the CIA that he had no prisoners to give him because they routinely ran over prisoners with armored personnel carriers to save bullets. The Khmer Rouge, likewise, captured one town and its soldiers went through each room in the local hospital throwing hand grenades to kill the patients. That the Khmer Rouge soldiers were ruthless butchers was well known by 1975 and that January they began their final push to capture the capital city Phnom Penh just as the North Vietnamese had launched an offensive to capture Saigon. Saigon would fall on April 30, 1975, just 13 days after the Khmer Rouge seized Phnom Penh. And 10 days from the fall of Saigon, a group of four brave American civilian pilots on an operation cobbled together by U.S. Air Force Brigadier General Harry C. Heine Aderholt would fly into Long Chang Lao ahead of invading North Vietnamese troops to begin a risky, dangerous Hmong rescue and evacuation. During this Second Indochina War, the U.S. had come to increasingly rely upon contract airlines for much of its air support. Airlines like Air America, Cassie or Continental, Bird Air, and a couple of other smaller ones hauled cargo, refugees, animals, food, and just about anything else that needed transport, lessening the burden on the U.S. Air Force. Air America pilots even earned glowing admiration for their daring rescues of U.S. Air Force pilots. Over a decade earlier, the CIA's Civil Air Transport, or CAT, had provided critical airlift to the besieged French in the First Indochina War, which demonstrated to Washington that civilian airlines under Department of Defense supervision could fill a critical mission need. 
The advantage of using these airlines, beyond alleviating the airframe and personnel burden on an already stretched thin U.S. Air Force, was that the U.S. could claim plausible deniability for many operations, and maintenance, shoot-downs, pilot injuries, and even deaths would be handled by the civilian enterprise. This cover was even more important after 1973, as the U.S. ceased conducting military operations in Southeast Asia. Officially, the Vietnam War had ended, but in Cambodia, violence and carnage had not even reached their bloody crescendo yet. This marked yet another difference between Cambodia and the other Southeast Asian battlefields. The bloodletting and violence actually increased once the victors, the Khmer Rouge, gained victory. Business really began to boom for the private airlines with the cutoff of all U.S. combat activities in Cambodia when a congressional limit was imposed, allowing only 200 U.S. personnel to be in the country at any one time in support of the U.S. effort. Although the U.S. combat role was over, the military assistance and advisory roles were not, and U.S. private enterprise with CI help was largely to replace the U.S. Air Force role. At first, in Cambodia, there were half a dozen companies as enterprising bush pilots flew in a couple of C-47s and ran semi-regular commercial flights between cities. Then, absent U.S. Air Force support, more and more civilian airlines sprang up. born out of bravery and Khmer government corruption, all operating on a chaotic, competitive basis. Anybody could apply for airline license, but liberal amounts of cash had to be spread among numerous Cambodian government officials. Eventually, there were more than 40 airlines in the transport free-for-all, hauling supplies and Cambodian troops. Even the unflappable Neil Hansen, who had been shot at, shot up and shot down in Laos, believed that flying in Cambodia was more dangerous than anything he had yet experienced. The pilots flying the unforgivable Cambodian skies knew that they had little chance of being picked up if they crashed because there were no longer U.S. Air Force search and rescue operations. And as the enemy took no prisoners, the risk significantly increased Everything was harder in Cambodia. Supplies were in short thrift, and with almost no aluminum available, pilots were using empty beer cans to patch bullet holes. Even wages were reduced. Air America had stopped paying combat pay to their men after the Paris Peace Agreement in early 1973, arguing that its operations had become purely commercial. Many Air America pilots quit or were let go. Former Air America pilot Les Strauss began freelancing and then flew a C-47 almost daily from Bangkok in December 1974 to Phnom Penh's fall in April 1975. As Cambodian security began to rapidly deteriorate with the Khmer Rouge seizing more and more terrain, the U.S. military, hamstrung by peace treaties and congressional actions, turned to a trusted U.S. military officer, then retired to facilitate Allied cooperation in a rapidly deteriorating environment. Harry C. Heine Aderholt was recalled to active duty in October 1973, given one star with headquarters at Bangkok. Aderholt was a proven performer for U.S. military air operations in Southeast Asia, but perhaps more importantly, high military trusted him more so than any other American. The U.S. operated out of several Royal Thai Air Force bases, and Thai cooperation would be essential for U.S. operations to support Cambodia or, later, for evacuations. General Aderholt was charged with orchestrating the airlift of weapons, munitions, fuel, and rice to Phnom Penh and besiege provincial enclaves in Cambodia. Adderholt argued to U.S. Air Force leadership that eventually 
the U.S. was going to lose a C-130 crew in resupplying Phnom Penh and there would be political repercussions. He therefore recommended to the Pentagon that the U.S. Air Force take a page from its playbook exactly 20 years earlier when the CIA's Civil Air Transport, the forerunner of Air America, replaced the U.S. Air Force dropping supplies to the French in the First Indochino War and in their siege at Dinh Binh Phu. Although Air America and Continental Air Services had a long history of such operations, according to Ken Comboy, the Thai government rejected their involvement in assisting Cambodia because of their public association with the CIA's paramilitary operations in Laos. Instead, William Byrd, who owned a construction company in California and who had run an airline in Laos the previous decade, was enticed to create Bird Air to handle the Cambodian airlift and in October 1974 initially leased five C-130 transports from the U.S. Air Force. Bird Air promptly hired retired U.S. Air Force C-130 crewmen and reservists for crews and by October 1974 the remaining U.S. Air Force air crews in the Cambodian airlift were replaced by Bird Air employees. Unmarked except for small tail numbers and base at Utapau Royal Thai Air Force Base, they began dropping supplies to beleaguered outposts across Cambodia. In February 1975, when Bird Air began landing directly at Pochentong Airport, Phnom Penh, they increased their number of leased C-130s to 10. By the beginning of 1975, the Khmer Republic, the U.S.-supported military government headed by General Juan Nol controlled the Phnom Penh area and a string of provincial outposts. The Mekong River outposts represented a crucial water supply for food and munitions coming upriver from South Vietnam and the South China Sea. For their 1975 offensive, the Khmer Rouge began to cut off vital Mekong supply routes on the advice of their Chinese strategists in Beijing. By February, the air lines of communication were the only way in and out of Phnom Penh and other Cambodian population centers, as the Khmer Rouge threatened or had cut most of the main Cambodian road arteries. Bird Air had already surged to 10 missions per day into Phnom Penh, which was the limit of its contracted capability. But this would not sustain Khmer government defenses and feeding the population. The Thai government agreed to help ease the problem by authorizing additional unmarked C-130s at Utapau, and the U.S. expanded its contract with Bird Air, which began flying between 24 to 27 sorties per day into Phnom Penh with 15 air crews. An airlift of 600 tons per day was necessary for the daily sustenance requirement for Phnom Penh. As the Khmer Rouge siege on Phnom Penh tightened in late February and March 1975, the airlift was expanded further to include commercial DC-8s hauling rice on shuttles from Saigon. Phnom Penh, like Saigon, had swelled in population due to refugees streaming in from the countryside. The city's population had grown from 1.5 to 3 million. Upwards of 80% of this growth was from rural refugees escaping the war-ravaged countryside. CIA paramilitary officers stationed in remote areas of Cambodia began to prepare for the inevitable. The evacuation from Cambodia as the Khmer Rouge closed in on the capital. These officers knew what fate awaited their allies because Khmer Rouge brutality was predictable and unmatched. Paramilitary officers upcountry such as Chip Beck and George Kenning, both who had served in Laos previously, began preparing a list of at-risk allied Khmer and their families, those people the Khmer Rouge would slaughter. Beck conducted detailed planning and with CIA and Khmer assistance established what he called Camp Exodus in Samrong near the Thai border and laced with remote trails Khmer guerrillas fighting the French a couple of decades earlier had carved from the rugged jungle. Beck and Kinning could not save Cambodia, but they could 
and did save some of those Khmer who had put their faith in America. Under Beck's supervision, 200 men, women, and children were flown into the camp awaiting the inevitable. Some were family members of Khmer commanders close to Beck and who planned to carry on the resistance in Western Cambodia. As fate would have it, those commanders would die during the last days of the Khmer Rouge onslaught. By February, Khmer Rouge forces were targeting Pushinchong Airport daily, and the incoming fire was making flying into Phnom Penh deadly. Les Strauss said his flights into Phnom Penh from Bangkok started out as three days per week, worked up to a daily routine, and surged at two trips a day. Les Strauss made Newsweek magazine here at the airport hunkered down under the wing during an enemy rocket attack. Towards the end of his time flying into Phnom Penh, his cargo included embassy personnel as they could not remain overnight in Phnom Penh and had to commute from Bangkok. Les said that one of his scheduled flights was delayed departing Bangkok by one half hour, making his arrival in Phnom Penh 30 minutes late. Five minutes after his normally scheduled arrival time, two rockets impacted his plane's normal parking spot. By February 1975, missions into Cambodia were as hazardous as anything they had flown in Laos. There would be as many as 30 to 40 planes concentrated on a ramp that was very small, and mechanics who would go out to work on them were often killed or wounded. Pilots and crew often flew through incoming artillery, in one case around going through a plane's cockpit, exploding over the cabin, killing 20 people aboard. Due to the deteriorating security environment, U.S. Ambassador John Gunther Dean began a steady evacuation of U.S. personnel from Phnom Penh to prevent a last-minute disaster like that which was later seen in Vietnam. This is why the final evacuation of Phnom Penh, Operation Eagle Pool, on 12 April was orderly. Les Strauss flew one of the last U.S. Embassy passenger flights out of the country. We had 63 seats on the plane and took 23 people out. We were scheduled for two flights that day, but as so few people showed up for the flight, we didn't go back in the afternoon. Dr. Charles Weldon was on one of the last Phnom Penh evacuation flights piloted by Fred Walker. You may remember Weldon as the chief doctor for the USAID effort in Laos. After leaving Laos, he and his wife, Dr. Patricia McReady, were studying at Harvard when Jack Williamson, head of the USAID in Cambodia, requested Dr. Weldon to come to Cambodia and provide his expertise. Contrary to the commonly held belief that Phnom Penh was the last remaining redoubt of Cambodian forces, as Chilt Beck points out, many provincial capitals were still holding out against the Khmer Rouge, fighting for their lives. Most continued to be defiant, even after Phnom Penh fell. Unfortunately, their valor and resistance were brief because of a decision Washington had made to withhold field deliveries of ammunition that the defenders needed to resist and survive. Cambodian forces would wither on the vine and die at the hands of the Chinese-equipped Khmer Rouge. So I'm standing in front of the old U.S. Embassy. It was here that Operation Eagle Pool was ordered. Not all American officials out in the provinces would get the word of the evacuation, and two CIA officers in Bakumbang province, George Kenning and partner Brian O'Connor, discovered by accident they had been left behind. George called the Phnom Penh CIA station the morning of 13 April to check in and a CIA Khmer assistant answered the phone. George asked to speak to a couple of officers, but was told neither were there. Inquiring where they were, the dutiful Khmer, still at his watch desk, replied, they all left yesterday. Left behind, Kenning and O'Connor began their own way out of Cambodia. Cambodian children, seemingly oblivious to the danger massing near the capital's edge, waved at the departing aircraft.
Neil Hansen also missed the fall of Phnom Penh as he was up country and nobody told him it had fallen. I was still operating when I ran across a friend in Battambang who told me that the choppers had gone into Phnom Penh and had taken everybody out, Hansen said. I had always thought that if it got real tight, I'd just take the airplane up to Phnom Penh, park it, and get on a C-130 and go out. I just realized how tight it had got. Neil tells his story. I was down in New Zealand when I got a call from a friend to come up to Cambodia. And I picked up a Convair 440 in Singapore and flew it into the craziness. The uh, Phnom Penh itself, when I landed, was eerie. There were sandbags all around. The whole uh, terminal building was sandbagged. And when they blow a siren, that was a perimeter, would hear a round coming over a rocket or an artillery round, and everybody would lay down behind the sun sandbags or get in the bunker. Uh, this is not a good deal. The ride into Phnom Penh, where I was going to be spending my uh, nights, uh, was on a road that had also been zeroed in. And occasionally they'd chuck around in there to uh, harass you and maybe kill some people. Uh, once in town, the uh, money situation was weird. One dollar got you $1,700 worth of reels. The biggest bill they had was a hundred real note. So you couldn't carry enough money to buy a Coke. It didn't work that way. Where I was staying was in an apartment building. The apartment building uh, overlooked the town. And uh, I went back and forth from there to, out to the airport to fly. And everybody wore the same uniform. So it didn't make any difference what airplane was ready to go. You flew it, whether you knew how to or not. And there was many accidents in that respect. Uh, the Convair I had, I lost an engine on it, and it got parked. Uh, another airplane came about. It was called Samaki Pianich, which is Work Together Airline. And this was another trucking company that bought this airplane. And it was in dubious condition. And on takeoff the first time, it shook like hell. But I was going to be going down to the coast and uh, staying down there and flying rice for them to various sites in uh, Cambodia. Uh, once I pulled the power back a little bit, it smoothed out. Well, this is okay. And I got down there the next couple of days. I was flying rice to various sites around the countryside. And one of the last trips I made with that airplane was to a site just to the northwest of Phnom Penh. Uh, you spiraled down over this place because it was ringed by the enemy uh, 50 calibers. And as I let down, there was a loud bang in the back. Uh, co-pilot, Chinese co-pilot I had says, oh, cargo fall over. No, I knew what that sound was. I'd been shot at before and got on the ground. And uh, it wasn't a very secure strip because the village elders had all been de their heads put on fence posts around the site for the birds to feast upon. And uh, they reduced it to bones and, and uh, found a bullet hole on the right side about four inches from the fuel selector valve. And it went through the the spar out to the top of the wing through the cabin and out to wherever else it went well this was not a, a catastrophic uh piece of damage I, I still fly it so i did and i took it back down to kampung sam and there the piece uh was pretty well in hand and i could do a leisurely walk around and i didn't find any other holes but when I came up to the left engine and, like most pilots, grabbed the uh, propeller blade, it moved back and forth. The whole blade was loose in the hub. This was where my vibration was coming from. 
And soon that blade would decide to leave the company of the rest of them and probably take the engine and or wing with it. So that airplane got parked. Life in Cambodia was surreal, to say the least. Uh, in Phnom Penh, well, the brief part of uh, my life that I spent there before going down to the coast, uh, I was in an apartment building. Four floors, pretty nice apartment. Uh, the only drawback was the elevator, you'd risk your life getting into it because you didn't know if the power would go out as you were up halfway through the, <laughs> the trip to your floor. So it was a four floor climb up to the apartment. Uh, also, running water was rare there. And of course, you didn't want to drink that water. That would have been <laughs> evil to, to say the least. But in this apartment, it had a little porch outside. And in the evening, it was fun to sit out there in the porch and watch on the other side of the Mekong River. The uh, friendly troops were firing at them and the bad guys were firing back. Uh, the good guys had red tracers. The bad guys had green tracers. And in the morning, uh, there'd be a, a, a whole line of tanks and uh, armored personnel vehicles coming right through town back to their compound to get refueled and rearmored. Uh, this did not give you much of a feeling of security. And also, food was a big problem. Uh, the market there where you get vegetables and things like that had been also zeroed in by the Khmer Rouge. And they'd chuck around in there every now and then and kill women and children that are out there trying to get some food. Uh, this was not fun. Uh, the one restaurant that everybody went to, uh, they had urinals in there, and that's where they kept the ice that they chip off for your drinks. So you didn't want iced drinks. Don't do that. <laughs> Bottled or canned drinks, fine. But otherwise, you're really taking a big risk on anything else. Uh, the Khmer Rouge were terrorists. It wasn't truly a, an organized army. They, they were outnumbered by the regular population. Uh, so they, they dealt in terrorism and killing their own people. Whereas in Vietnam and Laos, they didn't go in for uh, genocide as far as killing each other's uh, women and children. But in Cambodia, this is a totally different deal. And they didn't care who they killed. They just wanted everybody scared. And uh, it worked. It really did work. Except at the end, and at the end, when they won, they, they didn't know what to do. So they had to get everybody out of town. Otherwise, if they stayed in town and they realized there's only an X number of Khmer Rouge, they would they could overpower them. So get them out of town, just create a chaos, and uh, they uh, had control until they couldn't feed them anymore or anything else. And they didn't have enough bullets to kill them all. <laughs> so they, they died of disease and starvation out in the fields. We knew the end was coming. The uh, economy had started going downhill and uh, the people were getting real nervous. But the bad part about Cambodia, it was a civil war and the, they were killing their own civilians. And this was not happening in most other areas. They did not do that. But my last day in Cambodia, in I was down in Kampong Sam on the coast. And there I was flying rice and passengers all over uh, Cambodia to various sites. Biggest reason for that was the trucking companies could not use the roads anymore. So we were the trucking company at that point. And some of the airplanes were absolute junk. The last days, April 1975, I was over next to the Thai border uh, with a place called Batambang. And uh, on the ramp there, there was another guy that I knew that had uh, been with Air America, and he had a Convair too. But we could hear a 50 caliber firing outbound. Well, if 50 caliber is keeping the enemy away, they're damn close. So as we were standing there, 
uh, just twiddling our thumbs, waiting for the car cargo to be offloaded and passengers. Uh, one of the Cambodian officers came up to us and said, you know, all American go home. Well, we're American, we're still here. He says, yes, they come in yesterday and they take our government, our generals, your embassy, and all our politicians and they leave. Wow, that meant that these poor guys are out here in the field with no resupply possible, no leadership whatsoever, and they're just waiting to be slaughtered. I turned to my friend and I told him, I'm going to go back down to the coastal town of Kampong Sam and spend the night. The next day, I'm going to go to Bangkok. And he said, yeah, that'd be great, but I've got to go back to Phnom Penh to get my wife. I said, okay, meet me down there, but be there before noon, because at 12 o'clock, I'm gone. And he said, yeah, that's fair enough. And I did. Went back down there, and the uh, area was very secure, and nobody was really all that nervous. But the next morning, when I got up in the courtyard, they used to have breakfast of uh, papaya and uh, coffee and uh, I was out there and there was a Chinese crew there flying for Cambodian Airlines and uh, the co-pilot I knew and I asked him uh, you know it's not a good idea to stay around here do you want to go with me today and he says no I go with my captain and he sp poked in with a comment oh you round eye long nose, you in trouble. Me, Chinese, they no bother me. <laughs> I thought, okay, buddy. And they took off, went out to the airport. About 45 minutes later, uh, we went out to the airport. I had a co-pilot, he was a Filipino propeller mechanic. He didn't know how to fly, but he bought a license. So that's okay. And I had Stuart and stewardess. The stewardess was 14 years old. Uh, and uh, we went out to the airport. And the airplane was loaded with passengers and rice. And I taxied out and backfired the engine a couple of times and came back to the ramp and told the station manager, the Cambodian station manager, that uh, we're going to have to test fly this airplane. He gave me a bit of a jaundiced look, but offloaded everything and the passengers. And ramps in the Far East normally are covered around the border by pedicabs and noodle stands and things like that. And they begin to disappear. And it's just mid-morning. This is getting a little scary. To the north, there was a low bunch of hills and right in the middle of it was where the road came down from Nam Pen. It was a dirt road, so if I saw dust coming up off that, uh, it would be time to go. After they got it all offloaded and everything, I got the Stuart and stewardess aside and told them we're going to leave today. And we're going to Thailand. And uh, they thought that was a great idea, and they borrowed the station manager's Land Rover and went into town to get their belongings. And it's now really getting eerie. Even the military had left. And I got my uh, station manager aside and uh, told him, uh, you know, we're going to leave today. You come with us. And he looked down at his shoes and said, no, Captain. My family, Nam Pen. Well, you can't argue with that. Uh, I might have argued with him if I would have known what was coming, but I didn't. And uh, up above the low rise of hills to the north, there was a DC-3 screaming down towards the airport, engines wide open. 
he bounced down the strip and turned around, came back up, and it was that Cambodian airline. And the Chinese captain jumped out. We go, we go, Phnom Penh burning, Phnom Penh burning. I was tempted to throw his comments back in his face, but I didn't. And I told him, shut up, you're going to create a panic. He had Cambodian passengers on board. And he was going to go to Bangkok. Well, I told the co-pilot, you better just stop and take it into uh, Sadaheb on the south coast of Thailand, and maybe they won't put you in jail. Because all of these Cambodian passengers had no intention of going to Thailand. <laughs> they're going somewhere where they're not welcome. And uh, he, he agreed, and they roared off into the distance. Ah, it's getting up there about a quarter to twelve. Still no friend on the horizon. And uh, the Jeep came back of the Land Rover with a steward and stewardess like he was qualifying for the Indy 500. And he jumped out and says, we go, we go, nobody in town, nobody in town. Well, that meant the locals had gone out and were hiding in the, the bushes till uh, Khmer Rouge took over. And I said, okay, get on board. and. Uh, I climbed the uh, air stair into the fuselage and they closed the ramp up behind me and got into the captain's seat and cinched up my seat belt real tight, mainly because I'd been, uh, I'd had hepatitis and I was down to 104 pounds. And if my seat belt wasn't tight, I'd come out of the seat. <laughs> I tried to rotate the airplane. But, uh, opened the cockpit window and station manager is standing out there with a fire extinguisher. And he had uh, dusty tear tracks on his cheeks. His job, his future was all in question. So I started the left engine and uh, and he come up in temperatures and pressures and cranked up the right engine. And uh, I, you must have seen this thing in the movies somewhere. But every time I'd release the brakes and start out, he'd salute. And I returned his salute. There's no point in uh, running it up. I'm going to go. I taxied out into the runway and spun her around and poured the coal to her. It's coming by the ramp, about 90 knots, and rotated, came off Cambodian soil for the last time. Headed south to intercept the airway and going to Thailand. Didn't have any charts or anything. Didn't even have a passport. It was still in Phnom Penh. But as we climbed out, I went on emergency frequency and uh, Lufthansa 693 came back at me. And uh, when he uh, answered me, I asked him, I want to relay a flight plan to Bangkok. And he said, go ahead. And uh, I did. Gave him the departure point in Kampong Sam. And he was silent for a second. And then he said, Captain Hansen, Cambodia, airspace is closed. Cambodia is no more. <laughs>